Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, today we are going to uh, start our seventh <laughs> virtual rural surgery academic meeting. And uh, today mm -hmm. the cases mm -hmm. are very common cases, and speakers are from different parts of the country. And I uh, request Dr. Gonuraj to introduce the chairpersons of today's session. And I will try to introduce during each speaker's session, the, introduce the speakers. And uh, I request all the participants to keep your audio mute. Only when you speak during the session, you can make it unmute. And otherwise, you please try to keep your video on. And the, at the last part of the session, I like to have a group photograph of all the participants. If possible, you keep the video on. At the beginning, uh, uh, Dr. Kulkarni, our president, may be asked by Dr. Gonoraj for the uh, your welcome address. I let us let me hand over the microphone to Dr. Gonoraj, the today's convener of this seventh virtual conference. Good evening and uh, welcome to the probably the only program that we are having nowadays after the pandemic. I think I won't take too much time uh, because we have a limited time and interesting cases for discussion. So I'd like to invite the chairperson to start the proceedings. I think we have all of them here except uh, Dr. Malapa. We welcome Dr. Ora, Dr. Dilip Gutta and Dr. Runa Bal. And uh, I don't think in any of them need any introductions because they're all well known. And uh, they've been organizing these uh, conferences and they've been a uh, part of the ERSA for a long time. So I think I'll hand over to the chairpersons to start the proceedings as soon as possible. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I welcome everyone on behalf of our uh, Rural Surgery Association and all the speakers also, plus guests. Uh, we'll be starting with first case. Uh, Dr. Samar Basu will be presenting. He is our ex-president of uh, ARSI and also he had been a, a practicing gynecologist in Delhi. So he'll be presenting some interesting cases of vulval cysts and tumors. So Dr. Vasu, please, you may start yourself. Thank you very much. Uh, well, good evening, Mr. Chairperson and all my friends and colleagues who are uh, the participants of today's Zoom meeting. If you recollect that in the last meeting, I presented a case of uh, a uh, huge big Bartholin cyst, which was very unusual uh, in a menopausal patient. And uh, this is a part of the, you know, interesting cases of vulval tumor series. And today's presentation also from the same series. Today, I'm going to present two cases. The first one is a clitoral cyst. And uh, here the patient uh, came to me, a 36 years old lady, who has given birth to four children, he came to me with swelling and recurrent pain near the clitoral region. And unfortunately, uh, the pain as well as the swelling increased uh, for the last one month when they, she reported. On taking her history, we found there is no history of trauma. There's no history of dysuria, vaginal discharge. Neither she ever had any hormone therapy and uh, she had regular menstrual period, no ulceration. Laboratory investigations were within normal range. Ultrasound revealed normal urinary tract and normal pelvic structure. This ultrasound was done uh, just to exclude any, whether there was any abnormality in the urinary tract. Considering the location, considering the location of the now, on clinical examination, I found <coughs> a mobile midline cystic mass, which is uh, was three inches in diameter, well circumscribed, smooth surface extending from clitoral region to labia minora, presenting the left labia more laterally. However, there was no relationship between the mass and the urethra. Parvaginal examination was normal. Now, with these findings and uh, clinical history, we decided to excise the tumor mass and uh, very carefully, meticulously, we excised the tumor mass, keeping in mind 
uh, the neurovascular bundle, uh, which supplies the clitoral region. So the cyst was excised and the bulbar anatomy was restored. The dead space was obliterated to its natural form as much as possible. After, the, after we took out the cyst, we made a puncture and we found the cloudy mucoid colorful, uh, color fluid uh, mixed with blood came out from the punctured site of the cyst. So patient was discharged, of course, on the third post-operative day, early third post-operative day, and uh, in between she was given antibiotic. And uh, this is the cyst after removal. And the histopathology report was very interesting, which I read, which says that a wall comprising of fibrovascular tissue and lining of a combination of columnar cell and thick and proliferating layer of transitional epithelium. This is very important. Some foci of lining cells show papillae formation, however, and mild to moderate interepithelial atypia of the component cells, some lymphocytic cell infiltration also seen. The pathologist sent the histopathology report and concluded that it is consistent with disontogenetic cysts of Mullerian origin with moderate dysplastic changes. Now, what is disontogenetic cyst of vulva? Now, disontogenetic cyst is the result of defective embryological development with displacement of paranephric or Mullerian epithelial rest into definitive urogenital sinus. So that explains the transitional epithelium, which we saw. And uh, mostly it is paramesonephric origin. It is though very rare. And it is always common in the upper third of the vulva and usually solitary and pedunculated. If you recollect, the last time I presented this approximate percentile distribution of the cyst in upper, middle, and lower portion of the vulva. And you find that the upper portion of the vulva has 70% cyst with a disontogenetic cyst, whereas 20% was retention cyst. On the contrary, lower part of the vulva has 70% retention cyst and 25% post-traumatic and five other cysts. Now, this is the uh, pictorial uh, presentation of, you know, from say embryological, this thing, you can see the Mullerian ducts, Ulfian ducts, which ends into Mullerian eminence in uh, urogenital sinus. And uh, as we all know that the paramesonephric duct are responsible for the development of the fallopian tube, uterus, cervix, and upper portion of the vagina. Now with this, I'm coming to the second presentation uh, sorry, uh, disontogenetic cysts are of the following types. One is paramesonephric, that is from the Mullerian duct. Epidermal, due to embryonal re reorganization with displacement of the squamous epithelium. And of course, mesonephric from Ulfian rest. That is also not very common. Uh, uh, we know the para ovarian cysts, they are the Gartner duct cysts, they are the, some of the examples. Now with this, I move on to the second uh, one. Uh, I'm skipping, sorry. This is a case of angiomyofibroblastoma of vulva. Name is indeed very small. This is about a patient who was 46 years old, diabetic, and she was on insulin. She presented to us with a gradually increasing, slightly painful mass on vulva for three years. <clears throat> Itching and gradual hardening of the mass. And uh, on clinical examination in the OPD, outpatient department, we found it is approximately six to six into 10 centimeter. It is mobile, rubbery consistency. Papules were there on the top. Uh, it won't be out of place to mention that this patient was, was earlier under uh, treatment of a prime. Uh, important institute of uh, Delhi. She came to us before, because uh, she was not getting the date for surgery. And there the case was diagnosed as lymphangioma circumscriptum. Now those who uh, are not aware of this lymphangioma circumscriptum, it is a local uh, lymphatic vessels abnormality, usually uh, affecting the dermis and epidermis. So what we did, uh, we examined the patient and took the clinical history. I, we found there was no 
previous history of gynecological surgery, uh, the tumor mass was circumscribed margin, had pelvic examination was normal, local limb nodes not swollen, laboratory data showed no significant abnormality except the blood sugar, which was high, and patient was, of course, controlled before surgery uh, by insulin. Ultrasound was done and it was normal. Pap smear was negative for intraepithelial neoplasia. <clears throat> so with this information and clinical finding, we decided to go for simple valvectomy under local anesthesia. <clears throat> with little bit of extensive uh, surgery, you can say, uh, just uh, keeping in mind uh, of um, other infiltrating lesions, so a little bit more um, excision was done. Treated with antibiotic and local dressing, sugar was kept under control with insulin and patient was as usual discharged from the thus post-operative day. Now, this is after one month, absolutely normal vulva and histopathology is section source polypoidal tissue lined by squamous epithelium the stroma is composed of plump spindle cells with smooth muscle bundles and scattered thick walled vascular channels. Perivascular lymph lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate and foci of adipose tissue. Again, the presence of adipose tissue was very important. Uh, it was quite a bit of adipose tissue, although the lymph uh, spindle cells was of normal shape and size, and there was thick walled vascular channel. So based on this finding, the diagnosis was made by the pathologist, benign angiomyofibroblastoma. <clears throat> now it can be that the differential diagnosis of this condition can be Bartholin cyst, maybe lipoma, maybe labial cyst, aggressive angiomyxoma, which is very important. This is quite common. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, it, it mimics the angiomyofibroblastoma smooth muscle tumor, and of course, hernia. So this is a very uncommon benign mesenchymal tumor, first described by Fletcher et al. in 1992, not very old. Originate from mesodermal derived precursor cell. Again, there is a catch. I also really cannot tell you what is the mesodermal derived precursor cells, because when I asked the pathologist, I was told it is a new finding mesodermal derived precursor cell. And what I, I was made to understand that it is from the embryological, <clears throat> uh, what is that called stem cell, they could segregate this. So this tumor is mostly benign clinical outcome has, but then sometimes it could be malignant as well. Typically involved the vulvar soft tissue in young and middle-aged women. And this is the finding uh, histopathological finding. So thank you very much. So these are the two cases I would like to, I, I wanted to present. Now it is open for discussion. Any question, if you have, kindly let me know. Uh, good evening, sir. Can I ask a query? Yes, yes. Please. Uh, so, sir, if we get a patient in our practice, uh, say a young or a middle-aged lady who is presenting with a progressively enlarging growth on the vulva or on the external genitalia, what yeah. percentage what percentage of these cases actually turn out to be a malignancy and in what cases should we proceed for a metastatic workup? Is it all or only very few are selected cases? Sir? Yeah, uh, sir, I must say that it is, except the frank CA vulva, as you know, uh, these okay, are sir. Cases, as I told you, that uh, mostly they are benign, very rarely. And with that thing keeping in mind, we did little extensive uh, sort of dissection uh, uh, but but as they are simply benign, because this patient has been operated long time back and we did the okay, sir. last okay, sir. Uh, so there was no uh, uh, recurrence or malignancy. Got it, sir. What was the longest follow-up in this patient? Sorry? What was the longest follow-up in this patient? Sir, she was with us for last three years and thereafter she disappeared. So no recurrence, no recurrence till then? No, no. Till then, there was no recurrence. And I showed you the, the healing even process was absolutely, uh, sorry. This is the healing process after one month. And thereafter, of course, it's become further better. Right. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir, do we take any margins while excising these lesions or do we go for a simple enucleation in most of the cases? Sir, in this kind of cases, this uh, angiomyofibroblastoma, I think the excision is, uh, it is the white excision is ne needed. So that is what we did. Got it, sir. Mm, we Got did. it, sir. But the previous case, which was very interesting, the, there, of course, we just enucleated in a simple dissection, careful dissection without disturbing the blood vessels much and the nerves endings. So, and to count that, you have seen the cyst, clear cut cyst came out. Got it, sir. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Okay, I will invite now Dr. Uh, Saroj Raut for his uh, talk on progeton suprapubic polish catheter for four years. Dr. Saroj Raut, please. Okay, sir. Uh, today, uh, uh, today I'm going to present a case which is uh, unique for me as uh, um, in our OPD uh, session, I have got a patient uh, who is retaining his SPC for uh, last four years. Uh, uh, four years after he is getting uh, PPA urethroplasty, mm, and uh, on examination we found that. Take the next slide. Next slide, sir. Yeah, please go ahead. You don't stop. Okay. Just, uh, ah, a bladder calculus uh, introduction. Bladder calculi usually are a manifestation of an underlying pathological conditions, including voiding dysfunction or a foreign body. Uh, whenever we place any foreign body in urinary system or bladder. It must be mentioned in the bowl letters in discharge certificate. The, part, uh, the patient and the patient party should be counseled about the proper care and timely change or removal of the uh, foreign body like urethral catheter or DGS tends to uh, reduce complications. Next slide, sir. A 29 years old male presented in our OPD with retained SVC for last four years. Four years back, patient has suffered from pelvic fracture in August uh, 2018, patient underwent PPA urethroplasty followed by SPC. On, on physical examination, uh, on local examination, a shrunken, sticky, blackish, foul smelling SPC uh, with missing distal end of catheter found. Patient had no complaint of irritative, uh, whiting symptoms, intermittent uh, urinary streams, urinary tract infections, hematuria, or pelvic pain, or signs of. Uh, sepsis. Next, sir. On investigation, uh, X-ray shows a single calculus in bladder. On EVG, uh, 5 into 3 centimeter calculus was found in bladder. Urine anal analysis was normal. On, uh, ret on uh, retrograde urethrogram and micturating cystourethrogram is structured in the bulbomembranous junction with pre and post stenotic dilation was found. Next, sir. This is the picture showing the uh, bladder calculi. Next, sir. Uh, management. Supra pubic catheter exploration and retained SPC catheter with stone removed. Per urethral gradual dilatation and per urethral folly catheterization done. Patient had an uneventful post operative course and was discharged after three days with proper counseling next slide sir this is the uh, this is this uh, uh, spc catheter with uh, 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 bladder calculi with folic catheter was uh, extracted uh, uh, after uh, after operation uh, bladder calculi account accounting for 5% of all urinary calculi A color and Ockmore and Finlay reported that 2.2% of bladder calculi were found in patient with an indwelling catheter for greater than three months. Our patient had SPC for last four years as patient did not come for follow-up after PPA urethroplasty. Any foreign body retained within the bladder has the potential to form a calculi. The process of heterogeneous nucleation and aggregation are essential in the formation of bladder calculi over foreign body. Next, sir. Cisto, uh, cystolitholapexy is a process in which an instrument called a cystoscope is inserted into the bladder to locate the bladder stone. 
And the cystoscope is like a tiny telescope, a crushing device or laser or ultrasound uh, wave transmitted from the cystoscope can be used to break up the stones into smaller fragments, which can be washed out of bladder with fluids. In our case, surgical removal of the retained SPC along with a large calculus, calculus done as cystoscope not available in our institution. Next, uh, remarks. Next, we should counsel the patient and patient party about the foreign body placed in the urinary tract or bladder and its possible complication. We should make sure the patient and patient party understand when to come for follow-up and when to change or remove the uh, foreign body. We should write in bold letters in the discharge certificate about the foreign body placed in the bladder or urinary tract to reduce the complications. Next, sir. And the, uh, the reference which, uh, which I... Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, we just wanted to ask you whether the uh, catheter sir? was seen above suprabibic area or it was just a lost catheter in the bladder? It sir, it was, no, sir. It was seen from outside. It was seen outside. But yes, none sir. of the doctors have seen and removed this catheter for so many years. This is surprising. Sir, uh, surprising, sir. That's why it, this is the unique. I don't know when, uh, how and when the patient, uh, where the patient was gone. But it uh, came uh, to our facility after four years. When I seen the previous reports and uh, uh, out, outdoor uh, ticket, uh, patient was... Uh, uh, Patient, patient was made an accident four years back and he got an uh, pelvic fracture and uh, urethral dissection. That, 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 that history we already heard. There was no pyuria or any hematuria? No, sir. Patient, patient was, no complaint uh, at all? No, sir. Patient was absolutely, absolutely well, mobile, and he has no history of uh, hematuria or sepsis. All right. Okay. How, how long case. did you, after coming in, did you take the patient for surgery? Sir, uh, patient was in our OPD and I uh, got admitted to the patient and make him uh, 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 PSC fit. Then we have, uh, within uh, one week or uh, within one week, sir, uh, we uh, make the patient fit for OT. So what antibiotic did he give uh, during that time? Oral sir, or elective? Uh, sir, uh, after OT, we gave, uh, given him uh, uh, amoxiclap, sir. Anyway, the thing is, uh, interestingly, you got away with the thing. So one of the serious things about uh, Eurosepsis is that yes, sir. it can be very, very serious and dangerous. And especially any foreign body which is left for more than three months can uh, result in even in death if it is not uh, treated properly. Treated properly, yes, sir. May come uh, go in sepsis, sir, and patient collapse. Uh -huh. So the thing is, uh, so what we have to do is, uh, before surgery, even if they are already three months or six months or two years late, it is good to do the culture, yes. add the appropriate antibiotics, injectable antibiotics for at least 48 to 72 hours, and then do any procedure. It should not anything should not be done in a hurry because that can cause more harm. And the other thing is, to, a lot of people, uh, once you see the tube, I mean, uh, they are quite often tempted to pull it out, to uh, yank <laughs> pull it, it out, out especially with the DJ stents. That temptation also should be avoided, unless every bit of the crust and stone which is there is broken. You should not pull around, and if it tears into smaller pieces, it will cause even more problem. Saroj, is that at all? Ah, sir. May I ask one question, Saroj? Yes, sir. I am, I am very uh, eager to know. What about the uh, nature of the stone, whether it was outside the balloon or the balloon was just busted and it was a solid stone? No, sir, it, balloon, was, it, uh, stone it was with cavity or not? Sir, uh, uh, balloon was covered, sir. Balloon was covered. The uh, polycatheter poly tip was cover, covered with the uh, stone, sir. And uh, whether balloon was still inflated inside the uh, stone or not? Have you checked it? Have you broken the stone? No, sir. <laughs> So it was very weighty well, or it was very lighter. If it is very light, then we can say probably balloon was still inflated. No, sir, it was weighty. <laughs> and I am very also interested from other very experienced um, surgeons and very um, senior surgeons. What is their experience regarding the stone around other types of foreign body? 
or different types of foreign body professor galraj ji again renowned neurologist can i can i come in yes sir may i comment yeah please please sir please <clears throat> see we have seen uh, uh, very tiny calculi uh, around the stents which are left in the uh, uh, bladder i mean after doing uh, uh, puj obstruction cases i mean you do pyeloplasty in children or uh, uh, case of uh, 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 vr there we have to put in stents and uh, sometimes patients do not come back uh, even for a few months uh, although we generally remove these stents within 6 weeks they come even after 3 months 6 months and because it is not seen they have no symptoms but uh, they when they come up with some symptoms and we take an x ray we see that the stent is still in situ and <laughs> surrounded by uh, uh, concretions that is one example i can cite from the pediatric surgical uh, experience another thing uh, i would have liked to see the photograph uh, so i request the person who presents a case he should show the uh, such a case which is rare interesting he should have shown us the photograph of uh, on admission uh, how it looked like <laughs> uh, okay thank you okay even sir we have seen sir. that a uh, patient was there before the uh, dj stent was there for 6 years and then we when we tried to remove it multi, it came out with multiple pieces but then why we checked with ursl i have a uterorhinoscopy and then what we found out were multiple concretions were there along the tract with the ureter and we have re to remove all the stones small one which were around the dj stent with great difficulty we could remove the dj stent and put the new one It was six years inside. Patient forgot that. Hey, coming okay. to Doctor Sukumar Mehta's question, most of the time, uh, in the, especially the Foley's balloon, will not be inflated because once there is concretions around the balloon, they break. Yes. But then, uh, even when there is, even if we deflate the balloon, the, because there are concretions around it, you won't be able to. To pull the catheter if it's oh, a urethral catheter or even SVC, which is uh, yeah. put yeah. earlier. So one way of going about it is go along the catheter and uh, with the lithoclast, you can break the stones in uh, several settings and uh, remove it. Other thing is to yeah, that, go mm -hmm. a wide excision and uh, <laughs> probably open surgery as they did, which probably may be easier. But then you need I to give a thorough wash. and the continue antibiotics you need to remember that urosepsis can be very very dangerous and serious professor utpande I, i can find in the audience uh, he has a uh, vast experience in working in rural areas in the area bakuda mitnapur professor utpande your experience regarding this foreign body in the bladder or the calculus around the foreign body dr utpande are you in the audience yes sir good evening uh Sir, actually, uh, am I audible? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, audible. Uh, I do not have any experience uh, at Bakula, but uh, what I can say is, when I was working as a resident at uh, uh, Kerala Hospital in Nepal, there uh, one night it was a uh, winter night in the emergency. One patient landed up with a uh, large gut obstruction, and then uh, when we did an X-ray, to our surprise, we saw a uh, Solid uh, all-like lesion in the region of the sigmoid colon, and uh, then we uh, opened up uh, the abdomen and found that that was a there was a very solid uh, means, uh, what is uh, it was a solid stone around the diameter of uh, around uh, four to five centimeters. So actually, then we inquired and we found out that there was a practice in the rural areas there. We used to insert certain seeds into the colon uh, for diarrhea patients. So that uh, could have uh, led to uh, stone formation or something like that. But it was very hard in nature. So that is the only other experience apart from the common experiences. These are usually very common in urological practice. But that is one I had uh, uh, in a patient with acute intestinal obstruction. Uh, I have a query for sir. Yeah. Uh, 
sir if we uh, sir if we get patients in uh, the urological practice who have like in this case the patient had an indwelling suprapubic catheter catheter since 4 years and uh, foreign body retained for such a long time also predisposes the patients to stones or calculi developing within the bladder so we have a uh, factors which are irritating the bladder mucosa since such a long period of time so is there any concern that a patient might by any chance develop a bladder malignancy in the coming just like uh, should he be screened or like how should we approach this situation what's the risk if for some reason when there is infection very often malignancy is not uh, associated okay sir but then uh, if you look at the bladder mucosa I mean, yes, uh, even if you have a indwelling catheter for a couple of months it looks yes, as sir. though it is similar to malignancy got it sir if you do a cystoscopy look as the malignant lesions but most of the time it is uh, second due to infective granuloma and uh, biopsy is anyway necessary because you need to still rule out in our experience even though we see one or two foreign men for days almost a month uh, for so many years we have not come across malignancy which is secondary to foreign bodies but infection okay, and deaths are quite common for I mean, stents even I one mean, some people just uh, without antibiotics just go in and pull the stent out that can uh, that can cause uh, severe sepsis and patients have died also Uh, so sir if we are taking up these patients for cystoscopy should uh, biopsy be a routine and a part of the care offered to these patients or the decision is taken on a case to case basis so usually we don't do biopsy immediately okay sir so means so once there is a I mean uh, focus of sepsis if even if you take the tissue for biopsy or resection you are actually spreading the infection we don't want to do that and you scope the But, patient after a I mean, uh, six weeks to see if the lesions remain. Most of the time, if it is due to infection, most of them disappear once the foreign body is removed and uh, infection is treated. Sir, I think Dr. Jamal has already answered that what we should do is wait for six weeks and then do the cystoscopy. This should be the standard follow-up. We should be done after such the stones which we get after the foreign body removal. Got it, sir. Okay. And another important thing is anybody with foreign body stones are very very common. So you need to give them advice to drink enough water to pass at least four liters or four or five liters of urine in a day. Got it, sir. And before they get discharged from the hospital, we make sure that uh, they pass at least one liter more than what you expect them to pass when they go home. Because once they go home, uh, they may not drink as much. and if they definitely got it sir enough at the hospital they won't go back and drink enough water so you have to make yes, sure sir. that and again you have to repeatedly tell the patient relatives everybody that so there is a foreign body which has to be removed got it sir thanks sir okay okay thank you sir dr runa please uh, you can make all yeah. another speaker third speaker please so yeah, our third speaker. speaker our third speaker is dr shubodh vera he is from tamlu we will present two interesting cases in gynae and obstetrics particularly in the rural area dr shubodh vera you please present your cases uh, good evening everybody and specially our rc chairman and secretary and the chair person i will present one or two short cases which are very much interesting my first case is Mrs. X, sixty-five years of age, she is postmenopausal, and she present to my clinic with some vaginal serosanguineous discharge with pain in lower abdomen, but he is not able to uh, able to remember whether she had any IUCD or not. and after operation when i cut open the uterus i found there is a there is a iucd which is multi load copper and a degenerated fibroid in the 
region of fundus of the uterus, which is cut up and, and find in the picture. And this is the uh, IUCD, which is multi-load copper 250. And on biopsy, they give report that the, fund, uh, the fundal fibroid was degenerated one and a multi-load copper device in the lower uterine segment. Probably these two factors which produces this sort of serosanguineous vaginal discharge of a postmenopausal omen. And when I do the extended hysterectomy and on biopsy, there is no malignancy on histopathological examination. And this is open for discussion. This is my short case. Okay. So, uh, was there any uh, ultrasound you do before doing this uh, hysterectomy? Yes, I was actually I am working in a very rural area where yeah. not much facility of doing ultrasonogram one or two, but they are not much expert. They have no degree of radiology, either DMRD or MD in radiology, but they have some sort of training, three weeks or six weeks. Still, I send the patient for uh, uh, ultrasonogram, but they missed the uh, copper IUCD in their report, but they found there is something in the frontal region of the uterus. And on cutoff, and I found that there is a degenerated fibroid and on biopsy, they give the report that is not a malignancy. That is the good thing. Okay, so actually the degenerated fibroid or the fibroid was the indication for your hysterectomy, isn't it? Actually, uh, the patient is, <laughs> the, uh, have a severe pain in the lower abdomen pain and abdomen. see uh, um, rotated from one doctor to another doctor, but they are not able to find what is the proper diagnosis. And the patient with their relatives wants to do operations and remove the uterus okay. and find out what happened and do the biopsy. That is the thing. So operation was done. So during follow-up, she did, didn't have any pain? No, no, no. No pain and no other complications. She was discharged in a satisfactory condition. And on follow-up for one year, there is no other complications. So vaginal no. discharge and pain... No, yeah. Now it has all things are uh, resolved okay. by your operation, isn't yeah. it? Yes. Okay. Any mm -hmm. any other case you want to present? Yeah. My my next case is Siege, uh, uh, twenty six years. She had three consecutive mid trimester abortions. She presented my clinic uh, for future pregnancy. But her question is whether she have again abortion and abortion and abortion or not. And whether, and some doctors or some gynecologists advised her to do the operations. That is the unification operation uh, for this sort of spontaneous abortion. And as on HSG, there is a bicornuate uterus. There is two features which shows bicornuate uterus, but there is bilateral uh, spillage of the dye in both the sides. And so I decided to give some sort of project, uh, estrogen, that is the Progynova 2 milligram for six months and do other relative investigations including uh, the cervical incompetence or other investigations to exclude the cervical incompetence, which may cause the mid trimester abortion. But they, the patient and also the relatives are not eager to do any operations. They always told me 
without doing any operation, can I have a pregnancy and a baby, full-term baby or a good baby like that? So I give her medicine for induction of ovulation with luteal phase support. And ultimately she conceived and on ultrasonogram, I found the pregnancy is on the right horn of the uterus. But as she had a three abortions and the exact cause is not known to me, uh, I give a circlage operation, that is the Sirovka stitch at 14 weeks of gestation. And then routine follow-up was going on. At 36 weeks of gestation, I found the baby was presented by bridge. And I uh, decided to deliver it at 36 weeks, not much delay, as she may have uh, rupture of membrane in a odd time with spontaneous onset of liver and all these things. So a planned cesarean section was done at 36 weeks of gestation and a healthy baby was delivered and that was cared by the pediatrician. And uh, then the, it is open for discussion. Okay. So you did, um, you gave the estrogen. Uh, yeah. Yeah. What was the indication of giving estrogen? Actually, uh, uh, just to increase the endometrial thickness on the mm -hmm. ultrasonogram, I found the endometrial thickness of both the corner of the uterus each four to five millimeter only okay. on day eight or day nine. Okay. Uh, with this idea, uh, I give estrogen to increase the endometrial thickness and proper embedding of the fertilized ovum. With this idea, I give the estrogen and another arbitrarily I give the estrogen so that the, both the horn may be increased in size to cope with the developing fetus or MDO or anything else. Okay. Like that. And you did also the ovulation induction, isn't it? Yes. For, for after six months, I also provide her with folic acid and uh, Ecosprint 75 milligram daily, yeah. folic yeah. acid 5 milligram daily as a routine one and estrogen, that is the Progynova for six months. Then I asked her to have, try for baby. And a, along with that, I gave her um, drugs for induction of ovulation, mainly the letrozole and dufastone, that the didrogestone for luteal phase support. Okay. But uh, it, it is a bicondoid uterus, so space is less. So we expect, I expect uh, bridge presentation is a common in this type of uterus or in this type of patients. And as there is a uh, recurrent abortions, mid-trimester abortions, uh, though on ultrasonograph or clinical examination, I found there is no uh, cervical uh, incompetence. Still, I give a, as a preventive measure, I give yeah. a encircled stitch. Yeah, it's a, a preventive measure. Yeah. So... Uh, Thank you. Any other question from the audience or any yes. other? Uh, Ma'am, can I, can I just yes, ask sir. some questions? Dr. Dana, please. Definitely. Uh, actually, I was wondering whether uh, estrogen therapy was needed during pregnancy state. Uh, and this is uh, whether it is indicated rather. Progesterone, yes, some people they believe and they give the progesterone. Uh, so that is one thing. Of course, caesarean was done at 36 weeks or 37 weeks. That is all right, considering that she had so many abortions and it was an abnormal presentation as well as a bicornuate uterus. That is fine. But then estrogen therapy, uh, whether it was indicated, uh, progesterone therapy or dufestone for sustenance of pregnancy, it is all right. This is about the, this case. And about the first case, I was wondering 
why the property was not diagnosed because if you do a speculum examination and as you can see from the ultrasound that the property was lying quite below at least the thread would have been seen and it was not even misplaced rather it was stayed absolutely so that should have been uh, examined and done and ultrasound was very important uh, pain um, because of the fibroid uterus degenerated fibroid can can cause a little bit of pain but uh, the other things should have been investigated about the say for example pelvic inflammatory disease pid which is which would have been there perhaps and the copper t uh, itself for a, such a prolonged period of copper t can give little bit of cervicitis and all that can also give little serosanguineous discharge and as you said it is a menopausal age group of lady uh, she had a menopause postmenopause uh, postmenopause yes yeah. you know menopausal senile vaginitis also is yeah. very common and that also can give rise to serosanguineous discharge sir actually on But, speculum examination there uh, is no thread but oh. the cervix uh, appears healthy looks healthy uh -huh. and no other abnormality is there right uh, so i initially opt for diagnostic dnc and proceeds but the uh -huh. patient and the relatives told uh -huh. sir doctor uh, we will not expose the patient uh -huh. uh, two times for surgery what mm -hmm. you will do uh, one time and do everything in one time you do this dnc and biopsy report will come again you will operate scj older uh, elder one so you do one time operation and uh, send for biopsy but fortunately she had no malignancy it is yeah. it is a good and thing that is all right sir uh, clinically or ultrasonologically A clinically or per abdomen examination or per vaginal examination by manual examination i mean the fibroid was not felt actually sir uh, only the uterus is bulky uh, i think uh, as the fibroid is a degenerated one hmm. not a well circumscribed or in sir uh, uh, encapsulated one so hmm. uterus is bulky only uh, okay. there is no definite feel of uterus male uh, fundus fundal fibroid yeah. and so in the sir said your second question right progest uh, estrogen mm -hmm. in the first trimester usually if there is a, a recurrent abortion the exact cause is not known okay. Okay. that time we give uh, yes, estrogen 2 uh, mg 2 to 3 times a day for 2 months or 3 months Uh, and again uh, it will reduce the dose one uh, one mi 2 mg or 1 mg a dose up to 14 14 to 16 weeks not more than that okay thank you sir i okay. think time <laughs> lot many people have to present yeah the thing is actually sir think is that most of the gynecologists uh, ask the patient you do operations unification operation then you will get the pregnancy but they feared of uh, the operation was done there is some sort of interference and again if there is no pregnancy then what will happen like that definitely unification operation uh, does not always give a, a good result definitely there are so many problems associated with this unification operations particularly and the thing ma'am they, they are very much poor they are very much poor they are not uh, ready to spend some money for unification operation and they unification operation is a very rare thing so um, few gynecologists can do it perfectly actually so, on my practical experience i do few operations but there is no pregnancy that is very much unfortunate yeah, yeah. no sir bicornate uterus is not an indication for unification operation also because the pregnancy chances of having pregnancy in bicornate uterus has been reported and number of cases have been reported yes full term mm -hmm. yes term pregnancy it is, it is the septic uterus which sometimes can cause multi repeated abortion and all and there you need to cut the septum that is that is just cut the septum not unification operation no 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 no, no.
But that was once upon a time it was needed when there was no laparoscope. <laughs> yeah, laparoscopy. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Shubhut, madam. Yes, ma'am. Another, ma another, ma another, Dr. Ashok. Another Hello? short case is there. Just picture. This is a yeah. uh, bicornuate uterus. And, uh, and left horn and this is the right horn. The pregnancy of the right horn. And cesarean section was done. And oh, this car of the... Uh, and uh, she, she uh, 40 years of age and uh, no, that, that, that is a case number three. That is the previous case. That is the bicornuate uterus. So where seizure in section was done. Another case is 40 years. She is 40 years. She had uh, 19 years of uh, last childbirth, 19 years. He was admitted with very low GC and severe anemia, 5.6 gram of hemoglobin. The unit's blood was transfused and on ultrasonography, there is a left ovarian mass of thick size. And the CA125 estimation was a very, very high. But they're also a rural people. They are not able to go to the district level of hospital. What we have to do in a block level of hospital? Uh, it's a uh, doctor. You can do what you like. We have no objection like that. So I do laparotomy and total abdominal hysterectomy and left-sided salpingo ovariotomy with right-sided salpingo ovariotomy and infracolic omentectomy with appendicectomy was done. And post-operatively, two units of blood was transfused. And on 10th post-operative day, the patient was discharged in a satisfactory condition. But the thing is very much uh, interesting that uh, this is the uh, picture. This is the appendix and the omentum. Uh, the histopathology, the, the pathologist give the report. This is a left-sided broad ligament leomyoma. I personally talked to him with an operation note. I sent the operation note through the what through WhatsApp, and I personally talked to him that this is a case of ovarian malignancy. But you have give report to me as a left-sided broad ligament leomyoma. But after that, the patient one year not came to my clinic, not attend my clinic. But after one year, she attend my clinic with a slight lower abdomen pain. And when I examine my speculum, vault is okay, clear. Nothing is there. No granulation tissue, no discharge. But when I do a PV examination, I found a soft cystic or ten cystic mass in the pelvis. In the pelvis of about 5 centimeter by 5 centimeters. And patient attend the clinic after one year, the vault of the vagina is clear, four centimeter into four centimeter cystic mass found inside the pelvis. The patient the, attend the AIMS Bhubneshwar, AIMS Bhubneshwar. And they do the CA 125, 25.6 unit per ml. And they again, they uh, write down on their papers whether this is a recurrence of the ovarian tumor. If so, then what to do? This is for your discussion. Dr. Beda, actually we are running uh, short of time. Another yeah, yeah. Uh, speaker is there to present the case. So uh, let us uh, open this question to the audience. They think and they should uh, put their answers at the end of the session. Okay. Um, so, thank you, Dr. Beda. Thank uh, you. Now we can proceed for the next case. Thank you.
हेलो बोला सर डॉक्टर यू मे कॉल नेक्स्ट स्पीकर मे आई इनवाइट द यंग लेडी डॉक्टर शाहा टू प्रेजेंट हर केस ऑफ मिजेंट्रिक सिस्ट हेलो गुड इवनिंग रिस्पेक्टेड टीचर्स एम आई ऑडिबल यस यस Oh, yes, yes, you are audible. Rotate this. Uh, today I am going to present a very rare case of mesenteric cyst. <clears throat> okay. Uh, today I am going to present a very rare case of mesenteric cyst, which was presented in our hospital. As we know, mesenteric cyst and they occur most commonly in adults. of mean age with a mean age of 45 years and the mesenteric cysts can be divided in four types according to etiopathogenesis chylolymphatic cyst enterogenous cyst dermoid cyst and cysts of urogenital remnant this is a case report of a 30 year old gentleman who is a resident from bakura who uh, came to the emergency department of mmch with acute right sided abdominal pain and non bilious vomiting for the episodes of abdominal bloating nausea and <coughs> nauseation his symptoms reduced after taking some rest he had no history of fever jaundice malaria hematemesis bleeding per rectum dysuria hematuria chronic cough hemoptysis bony pain seizure or worm infestation and there was no family history of similar disease or any congenital anomaly on clinical examination the vitals were normal <coughs> and on per abdominal examination uh, we found a well defined overing from the right hypochondrium to right idea fossa which was cystic consistency non tender with well defined margins and it was slightly mobile from side to side and the abdomen was distended and mildly tender urgent usg and the finding was it was an intra abdominal cystic mass measuring 11.5 into 10.4 to 5.5 cm in dimension with thick fluid of finely granular ecogenicity on the right side of abdomen with an enhancing peripheral rim the patient taken to the ot where he underwent an emergency exploratory laparotomy <clears throat> the intra of findings were a big lobulated mesenteric cyst in the mesentery of the terminal ileum with twisting of portion of the tight terminal ileum the color texture viability of the twisted alcoholic lymph nodes were found which were slightly enlarged after prompt derotation of the twisted bowel 15 cm of ileum was resected in block and an ileo ileal end to end anastomosis was done uh, this is a picture of the twisted segment of ileum with the mesenteric cyst and uh, this is the picture after untwisting of the ileum the portion of the specimen revealed lobulated cystic cavity filled with milky white chylus material the hpe showed cyst wall was lined by flattened benign cuboidal epithelium with no granuloma or malignant feature the patient came to our opd for regular follow up for one year and there was no recurrence of pain and the patient was symptom free the exact etiology of mesenteric cyst has yet to be ascertained but failure of the lymphatic channels or lymph nodes to communicate with the lymphatic or venous system or blockage of the as a result of trauma infection neoplasm are said to be contributing factors the italian anatomist 
Benevini first described this entity performing an autopsy in an eight-year-old boy in 1507, while Rokitansky published the first accurate description of a chylus from the first successful surgery for cystic mass in the mesentery in 1880. And after him, the Tilok sign has been named. Uh, the conclusion is the treatment of uh, mesenteric cyst comprises of even of the cyst uh, it can be bowel resection and even partial <coughs> and even meaning cyst can be done uh, i would like to end my presentation here thank you can i make a few comments sir you can always sir. yes sir yeah <coughs> see as a routine in case of acute abdomen uh, one should take an erect x ray of abdomen which you are not quoted maybe you have yes. done it but you have not yeah. ma made any mention of erect x ray abdomen that is one thing <clears throat> secondly uh, i would like to say that in children uh, we have to also keep in mind especially if the patient is a female female child uh, over in uh, cyst uh, if the palpable uh, mesenteric cyst or palpable lump is in the pelvic side then we have to also consider uh, whether it could be a ovarian cyst of course sonography would give us more uh, information but clinically we have to keep that in mind second another differential diagnosis even at operation or at biopsy would be reduplication cyst of the bowel and that can also present similarly and uh, if the mesenteric cyst is quite separate from the bowel many times it is then you can do only excision of the cyst but if it is very adherent or very close to the bowel and stretch generally what we see is the bowel is stretched over the mesenteric cyst and in that case it is better to do a resection of that segment of bowel with the cyst and uh, the accepted pathology or etiology of this is according to uh, mr gross that it is the uh, lymphatics which have gone astray and they have formed this cyst so many times uh, if you do histopathology th there can be either endothelium lining the cyst or mesothelium lining the cyst and the contents may be either uh, mucoid chylus or in fact if it's infected may be purulent and uh, we have to also keep in mind that about 4% of these cases can be retroperitoneal and 60% of cases are uh, in relation to the uh, small bowel mesentery and maybe about 14 15% cases uh, in relation to the colon so they can occur right from duodenum to rectum anywhere uh, <clears throat> i think uh, we have to keep this thing in mind. while doing this and many people nowadays they uh, do this if there is there are no signs of obstruction no signs of volvulus and uh, if it's only a cyst it can be dealt with by laparoscopic surgery <coughs> all right uh, doctor uh, the i want to ask you why did you keep this as subacute instead of obstruction while on the operative findings you said that it is a volvulus patient presented in emergency why it was kept as subacute instead of obstruction so because the patient uh, so because the patient presented with multiple episodes of vomiting with uh, non passage of stool and platelets for one day with abdominal distension and we also did an abdominal x ray where there was uh, around four uh, air fluid Levels. Any, scene, which that I, is uh, that is okay. I am not talking about when there is a vomiting or so. 
because you said the abstraction was there it was acute at this office it was not so acute because volvulus was there i was just telling that second yes, thing sir. second thing we had a patient which are just especially for the uh, clinicians that we, we had a patient a young girl who presented as mesenteric cyst but actually it was a pot spine which are bursting into the cold abscess or of the cold spine which are bursting into the mesenteric leaves and it presented as a mesenteric cyst when we turned out it was pus and we took the culture it turned out to be with a pot spine there so it was a cold abscess it presented as a mesenteric cyst this is a rare thing we found out actually it was say when to 8 years back which we had any experience of other surgeons like this it was an anterior vertebra bursting like a cold abscess and then going into the mesenteric leaves presenting as mesenteric cyst this we had a case 7 to 8 years back so uh, any more comments uh, one I interesting have... one interesting uh, point in this particular mm -hmm. patient is that uh, most of the time we get the mesenteric cyst causing problem in the young patient the presentation yes. here is very very late mm -hmm. many a times we have seen uh, this type of cyst chylolymphatic cyst or dermoid cyst which is also referred and as professor uh, gupta has said that cox spine can cause this type of cyst in the abdomen similarly we have seen pseudo mesenteric cyst where the limb nodes within the mesentery has undergo degeneration following tuberculosis that type of patient we have seen that uh, tilic sign will be present also in those cases so when we are studying the mesenteric cyst we should also remember the possibility of the pseudo mesenteric cyst which is more common in the adult but in children the congenital cysts are more common and the same type of uh, swelling it is, it is cystic which is already proved by ultrasonography before the operation and if, uh, if in previous days when ultrasonography was not available we have seen few cases of lipoma within the mesentery and lipoma will have the same color yellow color like this though it, though it is a chylolymphatic cyst the chylolymphatic cyst uh, sometimes also is loaded with fat on its wall and that will give a yellow appearance as in this case the yellow color appearance if it is not a cystic uh, from distance one will may say that it is a lipoma and professor dr bhoda is very well experienced pediatric surgeon he has a lot of experience he can also comment on this type of presentation and and also you should remember the mesenteric cyst not only occurs in the mesentery this can also happen in the greater omentum transverse mesocolon we get cases in transverse mesocolon and also in the your uh, greater omentum that cyst also included greater omentum in the mesenteric cyst group right we have also the intestinal duplication yes. cyst can appear like this similar yes. things they can also the same thing dr sarnal is there dr sarnal any comment who is the mentor for this case is the uh, consultant uh, in this unit with dr rohindrila dr sarnal kunal Sir, sir, thank you. Thank you for giving us the opportunity for discussing this case. Uh, Dr. Sarveshwar Bora is uh, president of Rural Surgery Section of Association of Surgeons of India from Assam has joined. Dr. Sarveshwar, will you like to give any comment? You are working for long time in the rural areas. Dr. Sarveshwar, are you there in the? Uh, are you uh, asking me to comment? Uh, Dr. Sarveshwar, Dr. Sarveshwar Bora, Dr. Bora. Sarveshwar uh, Sarveshwar Bora <laughs> there is uh, a, a surgeon uh, Sarveshwar Bora uh, he is the president of rural surgery section of association surgeons of india yes dr sarveshwar uh, 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 thank you dr mohit uh, what i have seen it is uh, dr gupta has said it should be i think a type of mesenteric cyst Uh, am I audi audible, Doctor Butro? Yes, you are audible. You are audible. Okay. Butro, audible. Uh, thank you, thank you. I thought I think it should be uh, uh, not not a surgery, but it should be a cute mesenteric cyst. Uh, as mentioned by Doctor Malti, yes, uh, but, uh, the mesenteric cyst can be occurred in so many places inside the abdomen, and uh, I take the opportunity to thank. The part of the real uh, that they have uh, arranged this type of uh, virtual meeting. Uh, it is very good thing, and uh, 
Pramod. Thanks for inviting me to this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maiti. Uh, I have a question to ask, sir. May I ask? Please, please go ahead. Uh, sir, like uh, looking from a patient's perspective, uh, like uh, what are the chances that is? Are there any chances that might that this cyst might recur in the future, or there are no chances of recurrence? Like how often you consult the patient if he he asks such a question? Hello, basic, basic, uh, doctor. Yeah, 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 sure. Uh, my sir, one one comment I can do. Yeah. Sir. Sir, one question. Hello. Uh, hey, answer that question. That's question. Sure, sure. Please. Sure. 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 You please proceed, then you take the comments, uh, question from the others. Dr. Rovindra Bhura, please. Somebody asked about the recurrence. I think it is simple. Isentrix is uh, it's quite rare to get uh, recurrence. Secondly, uh, about 1% or even less than 1% cases, there may be a chance of malignancy. And then only you get, you can call it a recurrence. Otherwise, uh, in simple mesentric is recurrence. Got it, sir. Sir, can I comment one thing? Got it, sir. Yes. Sir, hello, can sir. Can I comment one thing? Hello. Doctor Vera, please proceed. Doctor Vera, please proceed. Sir, sir, as the patient is the male one, and we the patient is a male one, and the patient is a male one. I, I request uh, all other uh, uh, participants, please uh, mute your. Uh... The patient is a male one, but in rural areas, I found few cases who are female and presented with acute abdomen. And we do laparotomy as a diagnosis of twisted ovarian cyst. But on laparotomy, I found this is not a twisted ovarian cyst. Both the ovaries are normal. This is a twisted mesentric cyst. And that time we have to search the surgeon to, uh, to manage the case. That is the problem. You so can go ahead and do it. Dr. Bera, you, you can go ahead and re remove that mesentric cyst. It's no, it's simple. <laughs> doctor, doctor Vera, the but one thing, thing is uh, that everything is simple, but legally, uh, if I want uh, call the surgeon and uh, a opinion from the surgeon, I think uh, that is the problem. Doctor Vera, yeah. one comment I like to make. So, if we actually most common type of cyst uh, we find is either mesenteric cyst or a cyst which is wandering throughout can wander throughout the abdomen that is the ovarian cyst that can go anywhere with yes. a long pedicle. So, yes. for this type of case, what I would like to request the ultrasonography to find out ovaries present or not. If both the ovaries are okay on two sides, then I am happy that at least during the operation I may not have to call the gynecologist. Similarly, if a gynecologist find a cyst and ovaries are okay, then he should be ready to ask the surgeon. The, the radiologist told the ovaries are not clearly seen. That is the comment. Not then until and unless it is clearly seen, you have to go. Not clearly seen. You have to, if it is not clearly seen, then you have to ask, keep ready uh, in your mind. It is in my, your mind should be prepared to ask the surgeon. Ovaries should be okay before you explore the abdomen. Uh, in, in, intending that it may be a mesenteric cyst. But in rural yeah. areas, uh, no, not what always the surgeon is not available. Not that is the problem. <laughs> in the rural areas, surgeons are available everywhere. <laughs> okay. That is, but uh, best is have... a multidisciplinary approach is always best. Whenever you are in doubt, always have a multidisciplinary approach and that is safer. I have a question to no, Dr. Be Bera. Take the patient to a higher center, not in the not to operate in a rural areas. 
as we are a rural surgeon, better to send your medical college. Yeah, if surgeon is not able, that is safer. That is much, much safer. Yeah, yeah. You can refer. Yeah, much, it. much safer. safer. Dr. Behra, yeah. I, yeah. I wanted to ask you uh, whether the sonologist had done, uh, had used a vaginal probe for sonography. If he had used it, he would have picked up the uh, uh, missing uh, ICD. Um, don't you think so? Sir, I am not blaming any doctor, but the thing is that yeah. you know the no question of blaming. Know, uh, you know the experience or you know the credibility of the radiologist. They are radiologists, they are MBBS, they have taken six weeks training and they are the sonologist. Okay. They have no degree, okay. no diploma and nothing. You know that very well. I think better than me. I, I think when Dr. Behra is saying he is a rural surgeon, probably the radiologist is also a rural one and he not, might not be having the probe. That is vaginal TVS. Yes. He might not be having that TVS probe. Yes, it sir. is quite possible. Quite possible. In in both the in, in all of the machine for the vaginal probe, it will cost about three lakhs rupees. Yeah, so they might not be purchasing it. Sure, sure. That is the problem. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So thank you, uh, uh, speakers, for uh, participating and giving us. And then I thank our association for giving us chance for sharing the sessions. And uh, we declare the session as closed. Dr. Ravind, Dr. Tungaukar, please, the concluding, concluding remarks. I thank you, everybody, for joining today's meeting. Thank you, everybody, for joining the meeting. Okay, then. Good night. Good night, okay, good night. Mr. Thank Keso. Everybody. Mr. Keso, thank you. Thank you, thank thank Keso. you. Thank you for organizing. Thank you. For to do, give all the technical support. Thank you. Thank you, Keso. Thank you, Thank you, Keso. Thank, thank, thank you so much. Runa, be a member of our SSA, sir. <laughs> okay, okay, sir. Okay. Thank, okay. thank you, ladies thank you. and gentlemen. We'll end the session. Thank you. Thank now. you, Keso. Good night. Good night. Thank sir. you for your other things, for organizing. My pleasure, sir. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.